the seat of arbitration, where to go and why. Uh, well, you all know Professor Berman. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, Peter, maybe um, new for some of you. Uh, he is a lawyer in Brazil and in Germany, uh, sits as an arbitrator and acts, acts as a legal expert in arbitration. Um, he has uh, experience in Europe, uh, Germany, Switzerland, now Brazil. So uh, you see that we have two experts in international arbitration who will be very um, helpful in enlightening us about uh, what are the main reasons and what are the main concerns that parties might have uh, before choosing the seat of an arbitration. So um, we chose some talk topics for them to, to uh, discuss a little bit. Uh, me and Gustavo, we are gonna share uh, the introduction topics, but of course, feel free to um, interfere and uh, make your own comments and questions also. So, um, well, let's start. Um, Peter, would you like to tell us a little bit um, one of the main um, aspects of arbitration that parties may, might consider uh, when choosing the set of arbitration is the costs. And what are the, the what do you think that parties might uh, have in mind when making this decision? So thank you, first of all, for the invitation. And I'm most grateful to my colleague, Professor Berman, who interrupted his sabbatical <laughs> for this event today among others, and um, I'm also very grateful to you, Renata and Gustavo, for organizing this, and also to you, because I know that you are right before the exams and have probably a lot to study still, but you are here, that's very nice, and also the colleagues that are here, that's really an honor. Well, I think costs, we have to distinguish different types of costs. And I think what is often, maybe because they are out-of-pocket expenses, overvalued, are costs for arbitrators and institutions. This is the minor part, and I don't think it should be a relevant uh, issue. What is much more important, I think, are costs for counsel, experts. And um, these costs may depend on the chosen seat, because in different uh, legal cultures, you have different forms to charge fees or remuneration by lawyers. I mean, if I think about the extreme cases of my home country, Germany, where contingency fees or success fees are almost illegal, considering legislation for uh, the legal profession, and my new home base in Brazil, where uh, lawyers do not like much to work on the basis of billable hours. Often, I mean, these guys here know it better. They have been uh, working as counsel or counsel assistants. They normally charge a lump sum, relatively low lump sum at the beginning, and then a considerable, but sometimes very considerable success fee at the end. So you can see it's not so easy to compare uh, the cost of arbitration also in considering timing. I mean, um, lawyers often uh, do not uh, consider the time value of money. I have a formation in, in economics as well, so I'm always very much concerned with net present values and cash flows. It makes a big difference when the money is flowing. And for a CFO or for a third party funder, it's not so relevant when you get uh, the award, but when the money is going to flow in. And uh, there we have, uh, I think, a mo much more important point, uh, how speedy is arbitration, is international arbitration in different uh, arbitration centers. And uh, I think that that should be uh, an important point. So that's for the time being my statement on it. Shall I add something? If there is anything to add, oh, my, oh, it's down there. Oh, thank you. On? Is it on? I don't think it's really needed, but okay. Um, this event we're having uh, 
will not be much of a debate um, because in all likelihood, there's going to be a, a high degree of agreement um, between us. Um, it's not quite as if I were, we're here with Rob Smith, <laughs> with whom with whom this agreement and disagreement, right, Rob? Uh, so don't expect to hear a debate uh, here today. Uh, we may have slightly different emphases, but um, Peter said exactly, of course, what I was going to say, that cost is simply, is simply the, the cost of the seat, the cost implications of the seat are minimal. They're, they're simply minimal. That's not where the, where the costs uh, lie. Uh, institutions do have cost arrangements that you may find more attractive than other institutions. Uh, so maybe the institution uh, will be the factor and the institution might be the seat, depending on whether the institution requires that arbitration be local. But the cost of arbitration, I'm glad to say, is not the arbitrators. <laughs> it's <laughs> not the institutions. Uh, it's council. It's council and council. <laughs> and council. <laughs> um, I will, there's really not much to add on the cost front in my in my judgment. Paris, uh, and you will have enforcement board in Uruguay. In Uruguay, the court will see that Paris will have like a party of interest. You mean, um, does the heat from which the award emanates uh, have an effect on its fate uh, when brought for enforcement elsewhere? Uh, well, I, of course, I, that would be an empirical question, really. And I, I have no empirical information about that. Um, I don't know. I, since I don't operate as counsel, maybe I'm going to defer. Uh, the questions that you're asking today should be primarily from the point of view of counsel, because counsel is making the choice. So take everything I say less seriously than... Okay, uh, so uh, you know, council may want to think about that, um, but I think I can't come up with too many seats that are used with any frequency that would be disadvent distinctly disadvantageous from an enforcement point of view. I'm not saying there are none, but if you look at the seats that are chosen. I don't think there's a measurable difference in their, the reputation of the award. The reputation of the award uh, is more likely to depend upon the arbitrators, um, if they're known, than the institution or the seat. I don't know what Peter thinks. No, I, I fully agree. I think um, uh, an issue that is really more important, I would say, how are uh, annulment proceedings, how is vacating proceedings organized in the country of the seat? And there you have, for instance, a uh, very interesting example. Switzerland has an active policy to capture international arbitration. And they have a very fast track uh, annulment proceeding decided by the Superior Court of Switzerland within normally four to six months, just one instance, very low rate of annulments. Austria has the same system. And then you have other um, seats that do not have such a fast track proceeding. And then if you think about annulment, for instance, of a partial award, and if that takes too long, this, I think that should concern counsel much more than I think the reputation, I fully agree, depends on the arbitrators, eventually the institution, but. Yeah. Uh, 
we're going to get to annulment. Am I correct? It's one of your questions. So I'm not going to take that. Uh, Rob. Can I play the role of dissenter? I'm accustomed to <laughs> I'm accustomed to that. <laughs> on the, clearly in terms of arbitrator costs and other kind of ministerial costs, the seat don't matter that much. But I, I think in advising clients that the, the choice of the seat can have a significant influence on nationality of the council that are going to the nationality of the arbitrator. If you choose an English seat, you've got to contemplate like having to hire barristers and solicitors. Mm. Um, so the selection of the seat can have a significant cost impact. If you choose to arbitrate in India, you're going to have to hire a, uh, a senior counsel there. And the last time they went to me, it was at $10,000 a day. So uh, the choice of the seat can have a, a very significant uh, impact, even if it's only indirectly by virtue of who you end up having a counsel. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, if I just maybe involve a little bit our Brazilian colleagues in Brazil. It's it's a kind of um, standard practice, at least in big arbitrations that involve international parties to have councils, national councils, domestic councils alongside international councils. And if you take this into consideration, then at the end of the day, I doubt that it's much cheaper than doing it, whether to do it in Sao Paulo or in, or in New York, you know, because international law firms don't have much, partners don't have much flexibility when pitching. They will not make a discount for, for the seed in, in an emerging market. The premise, of course, which um, has truth to it, um, is that there's a, some likelihood that council will be local. But of course, we know that's by no means the rule. No, but in England, there's their pressure to have uh, the, informally. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. On that point, also going back to course, because I think that what you mentioned about the fast track uh, courses in in the criminal proceedings, something interesting. I would like to hear very much. But taking advantage of either of your multi-jurisdictional experience on issues of fees. At the very forefront and at the very end of the arbitration, that issue is going to come up. And I agree with Georgia, the lion's share of the council, the attorney's fees. And on this point, you may face, well, at the very beginning, the issue of whether contingency fees are allowed or not is significant for the upfront fee. But at the very end, when you get the choice from the lawyers and you have to go to the sum up to, to grant attorney's fees to one of the parties, uh, then you might come up with a, an hourly fee someone who is dealing in Paris compared with someone who is dealing in a very uh, you know, developing country where the, 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 the disproportionate is enormous. And at that point when you're saying, uh, well, it would be for the same amount of work that you're giving one party so much more than the other, it's very much And what about the Sao Paulo, for instance, big loss of the Sao Paulo hourly fee compared with St. Gallen or, or Geneva or, or, or experience on that, uh, the disproportion of those, those, those Well, as I mentioned before, uh, if whenever possible, uh, and that touches upon, I think, a, a deeper issue, uh, Brazilian law firms, I think you will, will agree, try to not to work on an hourly basis, if possible. They, they, they try, will try to rather take a risk and uh, go for a high contingency fee. And that has very much to do, I think, with the litigation tradition in Brazil, because that comes from litigation. And different from, for instance, Switzerland, where the godfathers of uh, arbitration were, had a background like George has, public, private, international law, commercial law, uh, the many of the godfathers of Brazilian arbitration are civil law professors and and, and, and have been litigators. I mean, we have just a history of 15 years, actually. The law is a little bit older, but if you look at the numbers of the cases, they started basically to grow up from 2004, 5 on. 
was. So basically, the first generation started their professional career in litigation. And that's that there's a significant impact of civil procedure practice on arbitration practice. And in civil procedure practice, it's contingency fee. So that's that it's it's hard to say. I, I don't know exactly. I don't work much, unfortunately, as, as we, I cannot contribute much as counsel in Brazil. So I don't know how, what the hourly rates are, but I, I assume they are that in, in, in non-arbitration cases, significantly lower. I agree with you. Uh, if you have a transaction lawyer, you will probably, it's hard for, for a Brazilian transaction lawyer to, to, to charge 1,500, 2,000 reais per hour, which is nowadays the... We have now five to one the exchange rate, so uh, that's nothing compared to New York. But you also, as you mentioned, look at the last ten years the exchange rate fluctuation between the U.S. dollar and the real. We have seen times one to less than two, and we have now again today one to five. And when you negotiate the arbitration clause and when you choose the seed. <coughs> not know how in, in, in such a market the currency fluctuation will react. So that's 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 makes it more unpredictable uh, what would be beneficial, I think. You know, just to appear on the contingency fee uh, concept, you know, in the US culture, it hasn't, it tends to have a negative ring to it. Like you, you, you charge by contingency when you're hustling. Uh, when you're hustling cases and you're hustling clients uh, and you're inducing litigation. Uh, now, I don't know if you agree, Rob, but it has that flavor. Um, and I don't think uh, the major firms, they, they do it if they must, but I don't think they welcome it. Hey, Rob, I hate to agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear, by the way, from reliable sources that there are occasions when <laughs> okay, so the focus so far was on costs. Now we're moving to, to another focus, which is the quality of arbitration law. So Peter, again, starting with you, what factors should you say that a party must take into account when choosing the seat of arbitration? So for instance, if the seats provide strong or a pro-arbitration judiciary, something like that? Yeah, well, that's uh, that's uh, two or three questions in one. Let me start. Uh, I would say uh, in the last two or three decades, basically all revamped or newly adopted arbitration laws have been modeled on the UNCITRAL model law to a large extent and strongly influenced by the new convention. So if you look at the plain text of the of the arbitration acts, I wouldn't assume that the big, the differences are so big. I think it comes more how these laws are applied, how strong is the influence of the procedure law, and how is the structure, as I said previously, of annulment proceedings. And that can make a big difference because it makes a difference if you have after four or six months a decision uh, on your award, a final decision, or after five or six years in the worst case. And um, I also think that what you mentioned, I, I personally don't like much this expression of arbitration friendly and unfriendly courts because that's not the issue of the courts. The courts, for the courts, it's an uh, arbitration is a niche, and they they have to apply the law. They are the guardians of the law of mandatory law of public policy. So I would say, if you choose a seat that has a rather a strong public policy, courts will eventually, because they simply apply what they have to apply, be intervene more often. If you have liberal contract laws, which are the most favored contract laws according to ICC statistics, New York law instead of California law, uh, Swiss contract law instead of German contract law, and of course, English law, it's also logical because there are not mandatory, many mandatory rules in these laws that courts that will 
check, let's say, in parentheses, uh, awards against the background of substantive law, they will hardly ever have a reason to annul. But that's not because they are friendly. That's because their law uh, is not interventionist, but rather liberal. Uh, again, there's a lot of agreement um, between us. Uh, yes, there is a convergence to a certain degree of the various arbitration laws. What really matters, as, as you said, is, is how they're interpreted. Uh, um, and in fact, I just the other day uh, was lo looked at the proofs of a, of a, looks like a great book coming out shortly uh, on the Uncertainty uh, Model Law uh, by a French professor who teaches in Luxembourg named Gilles Cuniberti. I don't know if he's known to some of you, um, but he has a really terrific book coming out that demonstrates, as if we didn't expect it, <laughs> that the uniform law is interpreted differently. So the Lex Arbitrary, I tell, I've told my students, uh, I don't know if you um, remember um, the Master Obono case, but that was the case in which uh, the question was whether punitive damages could be awarded. And you wouldn't find that in the arbitration law. Do you happen to remember? It was in a court decision. So the arbitration law may not label arbitration law. And that's, I think that's an excellent example. Uh, you would not know that punitive damages are forbidden if you didn't know that case existed. And you could conduct a very thorough examination of the New York arbitration statute and have no idea. So comparing arbitration laws is a, is, a, is a far more burdensome exercise uh, than I think we assume it to be. And that's on top of the uniform law being interpreted differently. I'm not talking about idiosyncratic, relatively idiosyncratic things that pop up in the case law. Yeah. And the case law may not be case law that's referred to in the arbitration chapter. Um, of of the book, so I think that's critical. Um, I can't resist though saying, again, the students have heard this before, so uh, apologies. Um, arbitration law, once you can identify it, can be evaluated. But I think some of you know that tribunals, I think, unfortunately apply not only the arbitration law of the seat, but the law of the seat mm. as if it were the arbitration. Does that come back to any of you? <laughs> okay. Um, and so that's the arbitration law, not the law of arbitration. I'm, I'm sorry, that's the law of the seat, but it's not the arbitration law of the seat. And my, my study of this tells me that tribunals, to a regrettable extent, uh, they, they echo or mirror the ways in which the courts of those seats would address the question before them, um, whether it's anti-suit injunctions or rules of privilege. I mean, all the twilight issues, if I can dare use that term, okay? So all these twilight issues um, are issues that on which I think lazy tribunals follow what the courts of the seat do. And wow, that has implications. It could be interest rates. It could be just, you know, the list is long. So I think that's part of the answer, don't you think, Peter? Yeah, definitely. And I'm, I would like to, to add an, an, an interesting case on what you, you mentioned, that the interpretation is sometimes different. Just look at how different courts uh, interpret conflict of interests of arbitrators. We have a very famous case between uh, New York and uh, Brazil, the Abengoa case. I mean, uh, the basically on the same grounds, not communicated um, counsel work of, of a law firm, as I remember of the presiding arbitrator, was used as an argument to try to vacate the award in New York. It didn't work out. 
on the same grounds, uh, the award was not recognized by the Brazilian Superior Court of Justice. The court rec refused to apply the New York Convention because uh, subject to Brazilian law, arbitration law, and that's why you have to look beyond the arbitration law. The arbitration law makes an explicit reference to two norms of the Civil Procedure Code on suspicious and conflicted judges. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to these norms, it's difficult, or it's the question is, can you really insist on causality, which the Brazilian Superior Court didn't do in the Abengoa case? And that can be critical. That can be very critical. So, uh, and another point that's important for international arbitrators acting in Brazil. I was sitting once uh, as a adjudicator in an ad hoc committee ruling on conflict of interest of a um, relative renowned Paris arbitrator. He basically uh, said in the written statement, I'm not conflicted because nothing of the IBA guidelines is involved here. But he was falling clearly under two rules of these two norms in the Civil Procedure Code. So we didn't even look into the IBA rules because obviously soft law cannot reduce the bar that is established in statutory law. So uh, it's really much more dif a different thing than reading in parallel or in a synopsis two different arbitration laws. And there's lots to be said about the issue of that, despite the uniformity of it, or it can call the law, there are different ways of looking at it. I don't think it's only a question of the lex arbitri being interpreted differently, but because many times the lex arbitri is just simple and doesn't really address so many issues, like punitive damages, like interest, and so many others, that then you have there, you're left with the law of receipt, which is nothing else, or the different ways of filling gaps. And how do you fill gaps? That's the big issue. And most people will fall under their own law. But regardless of whether it's lex arbitrary or substantive law to be applied, I think many people really trust those tribunals who are very strict on the sense, that's what the contract says, and I'm not going to come up with any type of creative, interpretive idea. And I, on, that, on that point, I think we can distinguish you from your can I draw on your experience on having your experience in, in Brazil as a, as a seat, as opposed to, let's say, uh, Geneva and there are other areas? How strict or how, um, in a way, uh, textualist are those judges with whom you work in one compared with the other? They, that's, that's a very, very good point. There are big differences. I mean, one of the reasons, and I come to Brazil, but maybe just step before, uh, Swiss contract law, Swiss judge, Swiss arbitrators, Swiss judges are much more contextualist than German ones. That's why many German companies prefer Swiss contract law and Switzerland as seed, because uh, the German civil code has two, three norms that allow the church to interfere into or to interpret in a, in a, in a, in a, in a in a sense uh, that he assumes to be correct. And that is also often in line in civil law. You have also this distinction. If you have a very detailed civil law with many default rules, sometimes the judge is biased and evaluates a contract against the background of default rules, which he considers to be the better solution than what the parties wrote, which is questionable. So if you have a, a relatively formalist stem contract law, you don't have this contextual bias. Uh, Brazilian contract law is closer to, and I've described this in, in my new book uh, that was just released last week on Brazilian business and commercial law, is much more, it's very contextualist. Now uh, you have even a norm that says that contracts have a social function. This is a very, a uh, broad term that ob obviously gives many a uh, huge leeway to judges. And, uh, but I have also to say in 2019, the, the legislator adopted new provisions in the civil code that allow 
clauses on risk allocation and say that the judges should respect these clauses. But on the other side, we have a relatively broad hardship clause. I discussed this yesterday evening with, with John Fels and, and um, other colleagues. I mean, 40% maybe or 30% of all arbitrations in Brazil, in Brazil are based on that clause. Whenever circumstances change and have eventually the consequence that one side has to perform an obligation that is more burdensome, then you can eventually challenge, even if this was defined in the contract as that, as, as that you know. So yes, that has a tremendous, uh, makes a tremendous difference. And I think it's not by accident that New York is so more popular than California in arbitration. And uh, the reason why London and Geneva and Zurich, um, I mean, I think Switzerland is still number one in terms of seats in ICC arbitration. So uh, that is ex exactly what I would say is one of the reasons. A part of uh, the handling of annulment proceedings in Switzerland that is very attractive, I think, for international practitioners. This is one of those questions where we see some parallelism to the questions you'd ask about the seat and the questions you'd ask about the, the arbitrator. So I think I told my students that the if you, I mean, a lawyer is apt to ask you questions about your disposition um, as, as arbitrator. And one of them is this one. Uh, are you a strict constructionist? Um, you've had that, right, Alejandro? Uh, are you, uh, you know, I, are you willing to describe yourself um, as a strict constructionist or a liberal constructionist? I'm sure you don't answer that question. Uh, but it tells you, you know, this is something that matters. And uh, it, it, it really features prominently in choice of arbitrator and a little less directly in choice of seat, but it's there. Well, my practice, in my experience in practice is if the question is to what extent is the arbitration legal regime at the seat, relevant to the choice of seat. My experience is all the seats we're talking about, London, Paris, Geneva, Sao Paulo, they're all, quote, the term arbitration friendly um, terms. That's not the basis on which you're making the selection of the seat. Um, this selection is made for other reasons than the legal regime. We, we assume these are all good legal regimes. Is that consistent with your experience? You know, your father used to say the most important consideration is the quality of the wine. <laughs> uh, right? You've heard that. More important than the legal regime. <laughs> <laughs> but that assumes you're sitting at the seat, right? <laughs> Which is not always the case. I was wondering, with the example you gave of the arbitrator that relied on the IDA in, in your experience, and when you receive an appointment from a seat where you are not familiarized with, you've never seen it, is that a matter of concern to you? some sort of research or analysis as a greater on what is the seat or if it's some decision <coughs> that adopted some sort of guidance from the model the model, the model law they feel comfortable with that just to see whether there is a matter of concern for the arbitrator of course, I mean that's that's uh, that's one of your basic duties because at the end of the day, you have to guarantee that your award will be will not be annulled and is enforceable under the New York Convention. This is the core duty of of the arbitrator. Therefore, I must concern myself not to to create myself a risk for the parties that the award will be annulled or uh, or eventually not enforced where the assets are located. Yeah, I mean, ideally, as arbitrator, you would you would not only read the arbitration law, 
uh, but you would read commentary uh, on the arbitration law because things do turn on that. Uh, and, and Peter's right. You're responsible for the longevity of the award. And it is, it is possible, but that reminds me of what I said earlier. Some things that might um, affect um, the enforceability of the award might not be in the arbitration law. They, they may be, but I, I've said that already. <laughs> but, but these comments are, are linked. Uh, so there could be something that would endanger your award uh, that you wouldn't even know of no matter how religiously you read uh, the arbitration law. Um, so yes, in theory, if it's a new seat, I familiarize myself with the arbitration law. Um, we tend to be in the same seats over time uh, as, as life has it. So it doesn't happen too often. I, I mean, a, a, a good example of what you can do, for instance, you can study uh, the book that George wrote with Emmanuel Gaillard on uh, the New York Convention, the guide to the interpretation of the New York Convention, because there you will find hundreds of examples of court decisions on exactly these issues that uh, an arbitrator should be aware of, including punitive damages that you can never enforce in Germany, uh, penalty clauses that are an issue in, in, in the UK and in other jurisdictions, the restraint of doctrine, these very few issues on substantive law that you, you must dominate if you act as an international arbitrator. And I think that's a, a wonderful source of, of, of hundreds of thousands of, of, of decisions worldwide. But you know, there's also, besides the uh, guide, there's the, uh, there's the website. I think you're referring to that as well. Uh, which is ever growing. And I think I always tell people out of some degree of integrity here, it's a Columbia Law School, Sherman and Sterling enterprise, but I can tell you <laughs> that for all practical purposes, it is a Sterling, Ster Sherman and Sterling enterprise um, in terms of being updated. Um, it's all Yaspani Fatemi, um, who's no longer there, but uh, yeah. So um, that's really, uh, trove. It's very well, it's very well indexed. Uh, you can find the article, you can find the court, you can seek the article and the court, uh, and you can hone in on what you want to know. But it's a huge effort. A huge, huge effort. I have to go. The first, first one is, uh, in your experience, I mean, basic questions, but who decides about this? Because um, many times um, I, when I like when I chat with others, I talk about our experience in international arbitration and uh, international. But my feeling is that sometimes it's the MA team when dealing with an MA transaction, for instance, who decides the clause and includes the clause. And in the Department of International Arbitration, you know, the, the practitioners receive the clause and, and see the clause. Okay, ICC parents. So I don't know in your experience uh, how it works because I have a friend, for instance, who is an in-house lawyer, and he says, no, we always include ICC parents. And I said, why? I mean, uh, maybe something changed in the last five years. <laughs> and he says, no, this is what we do in our department. We include always ICC parents. Well, that's uh, part of what you'll always exactly. hear. So maybe, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, uh, M&A lawyers or in-house lawyers, uh, this is what you'll you'll always hear from the, and uh, <laughs> Rob can verify this. You'll hear from the arbitration unit um, in the law firms how frustrated they are by the fact that they weren't consulted um, when the arbitration clause was drafted, and they assume that the arbitration clause was an eleventh hour uh, decision made by lawyers who don't know anything about arbitration or about different seats. Um, I think I agree with me on this one. <laughs> I just, but the only thing worse than them coming at you at the 11th hour, saying, what do we do about dispute resolution, is when they come at you at the 11th hour, having actually thought about it and written something off of, and you have to undo 
what they've done. <laughs> I much prefer them coming at the 11th hour and saying, <laughs> give us applause. Better <laughs> late than never. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is, however, I think some some rational uh, for the policy of some legal departments. Because if you look at huge corporations internationally, they have they are organized in regional headquarters of their law department, and they try not only arbitration law wise, but also in contract law or corporate law to reduce the number of jurisdictions they have to deal with because this facilitates um, and generates some uh, scale effects eventually in the law department. If I just think about the company that I, I knew, I don't know if they are still organized like this Siemens Germany. They used to have basically two law departments in, in the US and in Munich for Europe. And the Munich always Swiss law, Geneva, sorry. The U.S., whenever possible, New York law, New York seat. So it has a, it makes some sense. It's not, let's say, from a theoretical or from a purely analytical analysis of the one specific transaction, the most um, sophisticated decision. But looking at the portfolio of the contracts and disputes they will have to manage, it may be economically wise. I don't know. Well, if you're going to take seriously your and my admonition that the arbitration law be studied and arbitration case law be studied, then there may be some advantage to sticking in the same place <laughs> <laughs> uh, rather than venturing into some jurisdiction where you're a beginner. I think that might be yeah. maybe that as well as uh, let's call it path dependency. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Well, you talked a little bit about annulment actions, but I would also uh, like you to comment more on the legal and cultural risks of annulment actions um, through a perspective of whether uh, parties should assess uh, it is better to choose a seat of arbitration where there is a fast track annulment proceeding, uh, for example, in order to make sure that the um, the award will be enforcement will be enforced in uh, a shorter time, or uh, how do I should assess this this matter? Well, I think that you should assess this, but it's it's complicated uh, in the moment of contract formation when you agree on the clauses, and as a counsel have to advise your client because you will not know exactly in what position your client will be. I mean, if if your client not happy at the end of the day with the award, I mean, the best advice would have been to go to a jurisdiction where you can challenge it as much as possible. If we assume that in the beginning, um, everybody wants to have a fast decision, an enforceable decision quickly, uh, not knowing what his future position will be in a possible dispute, then I think it, 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 it's a very important point because simply for the fact that time is money and uh, annulment proceedings can also cost a lot of money. And they are considered by law firms if you are going contingency fees you know, this, as a separate process. So you pay contingency fee for, for the arbitration, then it's over. And the next step is, is a completely different proceeding. And depending on how long it takes, how are the cost rules there, it can be have a tremendous uh, effect on the overall. I think I think Peter's pointing out something that's very interesting. Uh, um, when we evaluate a seat, we can evaluate it at a distance, evaluate it more or less in abstract. You can say, to, to use the term, this is arbitration friendly or pro-arbitration um, in the abstract. And we can all do that. We always bring evaluative judgments about arbitration laws. But uh, when the time comes, your interest may lie in the arbitration unfriendly thing, like maybe a, a, a slow track uh, annulment um, will advantage your your client. Uh, very often, the question is, uh, are you, will you be the winner or the loser? Uh, 
And that's an interesting question. I don't know. I, I, I maybe council uh, can tell me. Uh, do do parties somehow approach these issues as if they were the winner? I have that instinct that even though there is no statistical reason to support this, that somehow psychologically you see yourself as winning the award and having to enforce it and pay much less attention to what will happen if you lose and you need to annul or you need to defeat enforcement. Um, but that's my, that's my psychological um, intuition. Uh, but that has nothing to do with what's going to happen. Both sides think, if I'm correct, both sides think they're going to win. I'm inviting you to agree. I, I, I need to agree. <laughs> I, I also think that the question about the fast track vacator procedure arises, of course, after you lost yeah. the arbitration and the case. My students are well aware of that. I was counsel. We lost an arbitration in the bill. And the question was, should we move to vacate? Well, on the one hand, um, it'd be nice to win vacator and then rely on Article 1 to resist. Uh, find one need to resist and request. On the other hand, what the likelihood of winning vacator in Brazil is low. But we counted on the fact that, oh, the Brazilian courts are going to well, this will take them forever. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And yet, lo and behold, once the Brazil courts were fast track and immediately refused to vacate the courts, we ended up strategically shooting ourselves. In the <laughs> oh, but that's, uh, of course, if you, but I said, mentioned before, if you have a possibility to not necessarily to win the, the vacation or the annulment proceedings, but simply kick the can down the road and think again of I, I what said before, that the council reports to the CFO. CFOs have a perspective of three to five years. If I can kick the can down the road five years, I might already be CFO or CEO in another company. My problem is resolved. So... Uh, yeah, I don't know if you're moving on to a new question, but you asked a very broad question. Uh, Renata, it was, I think, legal and cultural, um, and it, it's not all about an element, right? <laughs> so um, I was very interested in that question, as you put it, and I was trying to think, um, well, what is it about the seat that concretely, that concretely would bring those considerations um, into play, cultural, broadly conceived of, uh, cultural uh, 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 factors uh, that might come into play. And I think that's interesting for us to consider. The first one that came to mind is one that Peter referred to much earlier. One way in which the seat uh, can conceivably impose its cultural proclivities and preferences is through the public policy exception. I mean, the, hey, um, we all know public policy differs. Um, and, and so, you know, public policy is conceived of differently in many different places. Um, and it's ground for annulment. Violation is a ground for annulment. Now, again, I don't know what you can do with that ex ante. In other words, I, I don't know what, what that's going to tell you about where your interest lies, because we don't really know. Uh, but if you could guess, if you could guess that were you to win, your award would be in danger of annulment. Now, this is a small category of cases, by the way. <laughs> uh, then you might actually want to look into the public policy case law. Uh, and one of the ways in which that is reduced, that risk, the public policy risk, um, is, of course, through the concept of international public policy, with which you're all familiar. Um, so one way to avoid 
public policy idiosyncrasies, if you will, um, is to posit um, that what will apply will be an international and not a domestic uh, public policy norm. Um, but maybe Peter, you can think of, it's not for me to ask questions, but um, Peter, maybe you could, you, you, you can think of other ways in which cultural uh, factors might affect your thinking about the seat. Um, I mean, maybe you, if you like to drink, you know, <laughs> there's a cultural consideration, um, maybe, but I mean more seriously. Well, I, I think um, you mentioned previously, for instance, uh, the cultural issue in England to have a barrister on board. Um, uh, some markets have more resistance against foreign arbitrators. Um, that's one of the questions also in the end diversity. I think um, probably, at least in my impression, uh, New York is, is probably one of the markets that are more open to, to, to international categories. Uh, the concept of transnational public policy depends very much of the seat, in my opinion. Switzerland, for instance, I, I come back to, to, to Switzerland, they, they apply this concept to a large extent. For instance, there's a decision that I'm not perfectly convinced of that where the court said, we do not uh, evaluate the, the award against the background of European competition law because European competition law is just one competition law in this world, and it doesn't represent a transnational standard. So, and, and despite the fact that both parties were Italian parties and they were subject to that law, it's, it's and obviously if you go out of Switzerland, you will, they will not- They didn't read the Echo Swiss. Of, ca of course, They didn't of read course. the Echo Swiss decision. Yeah, that's why uh, I think it's-, it's, it's yeah. It's wrong, the decision. But but then you have Brazil, for instance, where several procedural public policy rules are only reflecting constitutional guarantees. If you have a very ample constitution, a very detailed constitution, the courts will consider this, must consider this almost automatically uh, as public policy. And that can say it's it's just transnational public policy. I think it, it matters a lot, the, the cultural approach to it. Yeah. I think public policy is going to be the entry point. Uh, I think it's going to be the major entry point for these considerations. And I think also, as you pointed out, Peter, that the notion of public policy is very much closely related to constitutional guarantees. What type of and what type of uh, uh, mindset the judges have about their duty to constitution that they have to do. On that point, I mean, it is very difficult to articulate cultural idiosyncrasy that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It's interesting to hear you with your experience in Swiss and Germany, because from the outside, one might think that their jurisdiction is very much alike, but someone who is familiar with them knows the differences. Could you, would you dare to uh, somehow, I wouldn't say classify, but yes, take into account that in judiciaries all over the world, including uh, sophisticated and sought after venues for, for, for arbitration, there are judges whose approach to arbitration is more friendly or less hostile than in others. I mean, I think that there are, uh, aside from the what the, the judiciary says about pro-arbitration bias, or et cetera, isn't it true that some judges really don't like very much this idea of having this parallel judicial uh, system of administration of justice? And others are very happy to get rid of those all the other cases that shouldn't come to court. What's your view on that? I think there are differences, really. I, I mean, I had some discussed this last week in, in London with uh, Justice. And um, I think there's also a little bit problem. If you are too successful in arbitration, you might create um, some kind of, of clashback. For instance, in Brazil, um, arbitration has become so successful in corporate law matters that almost no cases go anymore to the courts. And uh, I think after a while uh, that uh, the, the courts realize that they are not anymore shaping uh, corporate law. And 
this eventually bounces now a little bit back. Also because corporate law disputes are still mostly confidential. And then arises the question, development of law, arbitration, should it develop, can or should it uh, contribute to the development of the law? How can it if it's confidential? I think, and then you have judges that don't like that and that they even change their mind. And certainly it makes a big difference if you are in New York where you have the 150, 200 years tradition of arbitration, or if you have in a market where you have maybe just 15 to 20 years and where it was a big success, but, but then suddenly maybe you have a consolidation phase, you have some concerns, or you have markets like Germany that never really appreciated much uh, arbitration, at least not uh, in domestic. Even in Switzerland, you have very few domestic arbitrations, by the way. Uh, so I think you are comp that is comp certainly the fact. Let me just allow Mike Lampert, who's watching us, to, to ask a question here. Just a moment. Mike, can you talk? Uh, I can. <clears throat> Excuse me, I can if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the comment I was going to make is another factor that may affect the choice of seat is the degree to which the parties have gone to arbitration in the first place to preserve confidentiality or privacy because judicial systems vary rather dramatically on the degree to which that can be protected. In the United States, one would need to attach the award and that would be in a document that's accessible in most courts by web. In the UK, one would have to make an application to, if one want, a non-party wanted to see the award to ask the judge for permission and then get it from counsel. And my understanding is in the Swiss courts, it would be filed, but the file of the court would not be public. So isn't the confidentiality attributes of the seats courts a factor that one would consider if one believes confidentiality matters as a reason to go to arbitration? I think that sounds right. And I would say that's one of those rare considerations where you could know where you stand ex ante. I think that's one of the rare ones. You could, you could know, given the industry you're in, the competitiveness of the industry, uh, the, the facts that are likely to emerge from a dispute about your, your client base, about your business plans, so I would say, I would say, Mike, that's a nice one as an example of something you really could, I think, predict where your interest lies before the dispute occurs. Yeah, I think that that's a very good point, but I think you also have to consider the times in which we are living. Uh, confidentiality is a, is a very complicated issue, and sometimes you see that um, in some cases that interested parties, let's say, they, they find ways to, to push information to media or to, to third parties. So I think confidentiality is, is getting ever more uh, difficult to secure, even if you agreed on it. So I think it becomes even more unpredictable how, how this will end up for, to have an impact on your, on, on your situation in, in the case in hand. Um, yeah, and I think that over time, we need to be more and more attentive to what the presumptions are within institutions about confidentiality, because we actually have opt-ins, we have opt-outs, we have, we have different presumptions now. And I, I've been in this long enough to remember when we didn't, <laughs> when, when it was confidential. Uh, it was not just assumption. I mean, you could disclose it if you both agreed uh, after the fact, but uh, presumptions are changing. Are changing now, and and it's a you you have a student who's going to write a paper on this. I think you know. Okay. So <laughs> you know on what. On what <laughs> So does anyone have any more questions? Uh, I think we are running out of time, but uh, just 
if you could just uh, mention briefly a little bit about, well, you both have um, experience with different jurisdictions, uh, seats of arbitration, and what's your opinion on diversity uh, regarding the choice of arbitrators? Is it better to have a diverse tribunal, arbitral tribunal, or not? Does it uh, affect the result of the, the arbitration? I'm not sure how that relates to the seat. Um, yeah, not necessarily. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to speak first about this, but I don't think it's a seat related. I don't think it's a seat issue in any way I can identify. I think it shouldn't be a seat related <laughs> issue. Sometimes you have maybe seats where there is more resistance to, to foreign arbitrators than in other places where it's more open-minded. I think from the New York perspective, really, it, it, it doesn't, isn't, isn't related to the seat, but eventually in, in other places. I think diversity in terms of, if you have international contracts, cross-border deals, uh, it's very important to have people from different jurisdictions that look at diff from different angles at the contract. And because if you have eventually three, and this is in some jurisdictions not uncommon, if you have three arbitrators, maybe from the same law school, looking in this through the same through the same classes at the contract, uh, you might have a different result. If you have, uh, let's say, even if you look constructive lawyers, uh, formalist, neo-formalist, or whatsoever, and this goes, and this is of course uh, very much also related to the how how you are biased by the first law school uh, you visited eventually, or the first law contract law you got to, to know, and if you can really step aside, and then if you mix tribunals, you have better results. In my opinion, just look at the ECJ or the International Criminal Court. Um, but but on the seat, if I can <laughs> return to the seat. Um, the uh, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators uh, has issued something called the London Principles, uh, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and at their, I think it was their centennial, well, I'm not entirely sure. I think it was at the centennial that they, they issued these. And you might want to take a look at them. It's a long list. I happen to have it in front of me. Um, a very long list of factors to be taken into consideration. I, could read it to you, but I won't. Um, but what I tried to do was to determine for these factors, each of these factors, what, what the impact would be if they were followed or not followed. In other words, consequences are of these various London principles. But as I look at now, I'd say there looks like there are about 12 uh, all entirely predictable, uh, some of which we mentioned today. Let me quickly, um, yeah, these days, <laughs> we haven't mentioned it yet. Ready access to the country for counsel and witnesses. And suddenly that's surfacing. Um, how, how easy or difficult will it be uh, if it's in person? Assuming it's in person. Uh, now, if it can be in person, it, it, but by definition, we're probably not in the worst situation, but with, with entry barriers. But it's something that's been, I know it's been taken into consideration. Right now, I'm in a case where uh, it's an exit case, so no seat was predetermined. And um, the decision on the seat is, I, appears to be going to turn on the relative ease of witnesses and counsel entering the country. Uh, so it actually is coming into play. Uh, so, uh, but as I look at the others, um, the only one we haven't mentioned, well, we didn't mention independence of the judiciary. I think we did. We, we, we didn't have to mention it. Um, we, we know it. Um, the only one here that I think we haven't touched upon is immunity. Uh, the immunity of arbitrators. Uh, there's some likelihood that if there were litigation, some likelihood that it would occur at the seat. Now, it's not necessarily the case. You could be 
You could be resident domiciliary of the jurisdiction other than the seat and be sued there. But a seat is the most likely or a likely a place for litigation to occur. And I don't know, some, some council, again, I'm not, I'm not council, so I don't know. Some council may consider that an important consideration. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's the only thing I can come up with that would cause you any, you know, to think out of the box. Some of the trader schools, Josh, I mean, I've been sitting in, in panels where some of the traders have been very close to, including in arbitration law. Assuming it's enforceable. <laughs> yeah. Arbitration comes within arbitration. And this issue of the immunity of arbitrators definitely is very much varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Oh. It's another one. I'm not detracting from the importance of the dimension. I do think that diversity is <coughs> because not because we don't think that diversity is not good, but the awareness about the relevance of diversity. And what aspect of diversity? Gender, race, by a language or what? That's not a, a concern that it seems to me on part of. I think that they, uh, and probably not so much about party appointed arbitrators, but I do think from the institutions, as Georgia pointed out, it should be paramount. But it's not to be taken for granted that every jurisdiction is aware of the relevance of having diversity in the panels of arbitrators. Again, it's given to be less about it. And many of them are not aware of that. That difference that if someone tells you, well, but don't you think that for diversity, Think we should appoint, you know, a woman or a man. And you, you haven't thought about it, yet, but you have thought about many other issues, but not this one, because people sometimes are not aware. I think that cultural specific issue. Um, it's we all know it's very very rare, but I guess this discussion would be incomplete if we didn't at least pay lip service to the possibility that um, you would uh, choose an arbitration law other than the. Because we know that theoretically uh, that that is possible. So our discussion thus far, I think to some extent has has rested on the assumption that it will be the arbitration law of the seat that will govern the arbitration. Now, um, in that practically, I mean, I don't personally know any case. I know it, they're supposed to exist, cases that which parties, have expressly agreed on an arbitration law other than the law of the seat. Um, but if that's done, then on many of the issues we've been discussing, um, it, it won't be the seat yeah. that matters. Um, and I'll simply say in the restatement, one of the things we had to address was in that rare circumstance where you have chosen a seat, but chosen the arbitration law of another seat, which jurisdictions courts have annulment authority, you know? And that was, I mean, we don't have case law because we don't have that scenario, but I think it really, it really captures it. Just think for a moment, the restatement takes the position, by the way, that the law you chose to govern your arbitration is the jurisdiction with annulment authority, but it was debated. Yeah. Now we didn't spend much time on this because we should, <laughs> right? Because it doesn't happen. I mean, the the just come quickly back to the immunity issue that that is really uh, for arbitrators important, <laughs> and because it it also the that in different markets the possibility to get insurance coverage and to what extent is very different. So. Um, and there we might see in, in, in some, some more problematic issues related to questions of, uh, of uh, conflict of interest. If you provoke the, the annulment eventually, yeah. then it's, it's good to have insurance coverage <laughs> if, if you can get it. You know, not to, not to dwell on the restatement, but I have to say immunity was a hot topic because a minority of our advisors and the, and the reporters themselves, myself included, 
I know this is going to sound terrible to you, um, thought that must be circumstances in which an arbitrator should be accountable um, on the understanding that, you know, you have contractual obligations. And once you have immunity, you are unaccountable mm. for your contractual violations. Uh, but the bar, well represented in the ALI, would have nothing of it. So the restatement says absolute immunity. But that tells you that there are lawyers care, <laughs> as you say, Peter. Not even negligence? Not even gross negligence. And, you know, if you step back and, and you, you take decidedly take off any pro-arbitration hat you might be wearing, just take off any garment on you that's pro-arbitration, and you say reckless disregard, gross negligence, should you really, unlike anybody, any other service provider in the world, be categorically immune? I mean, it, it is at least gives you pause, right, Alejandro? But it, 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 isn't that very connected with the notion of immunity of the judicial? Of course, that's the model. Yeah. That yeah. is the basis for this. It wouldn't it wouldn't be absolute if it weren't analogized. Uh, to judges. Yeah. Um, I'll continue with the proceeding against what the court said. Because the thing is that now there is a case that the arbitrator decided to change the seat that was in Spain and he decided to change the seat to Paris. And the court, you know, ordered and moved the nomination of the arbitration. And this arbitrator decided to change the seat to Paris because it's like more protected there. And the court has issued a criminal defense against the arbitrator because continued with the proceedings of the arbitration, um, no, not following the court sentence. So immunity in this case would be important. Yeah. But surely this was done with the consent of the parties. Yes. Arbitrators arbitrators don't unilaterally change the seat. One of the parties uh, <laughs> oh. has not responded to it. But I mean once once you have party autonomy um, in the mix, you know, th that change that yeah. changes the equation a little bit. If if the parties were in agreement that the seat should be changed, I would think that would be presumptively respected. Unless one were to make some argument that it represented fraud on the law, uh, circumvention of, of the public policy of, of the seat, but that would be a high hurdle. My instinct is that you wouldn't do it without the party's agreement. And if you have party's agreement, it should fly. What do you think, Peter? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I mean, uh, party autonomy is the backbone of, of arbitration, international arbitrations in particular. So if parties agree, you, you should be able to change the seat. Also because think about a contract that is maybe 20, 30 years old and when the dispute arises, so it couldn't make much sense to circumstances may have changed in, in the country where that was defined in the first place. So if there's agreement or in that case, I think uh, I heard about that case that was at least from one party, no objection. Yeah, it's very particular. Yeah. Malaysia against... Uh, Owner of Sultan, Malaysia, and there was, you know, this lending of part of Malaysia loaded, and uh, the Sultan that says that owns this, uh, this land, and there was an arbitration clause in this contract of lending, very old, like from the 19th century. And now there is a dispute that arises out of this contract, and there is this arbitration clause, so very old, and there was uh, arbitration and Malaysia. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Well, Peter and I both um, emphasize party autonomy. I have to confess, though, that party autonomy is not unlimited, and that's another whole story. Um, there are things parties can't agree to, 
And if somehow the Spanish authorities could convince themselves that the parties had done something that exceeds the bounds of party autonomy, but that is what would have to be shown. And I don't think that's an easy showing that Spanish public policy, uh, assuming that could, could matter, yeah, that Spanish public policy would be offended. Changing the seat from Madrid to Paris, it doesn't seem so weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think we could go on for the rest of the day <laughs> with all these interesting discussions, uh, but I'm afraid we ran out of time. So thank you very much, Professors Berman and Professor Sester. And also, I would like to thank you all for engaging in this discussion and making uh, everything so much uh, more interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you.